This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome in to another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bartholomew. Today, we assess the 2020 presidential election with the Publix Radio's political commentator, Scott McKay. All right, day three of our week-long series of daily podcasts here ahead of Election Day. Yesterday, we had Attorney General Peter Narona on the program discussing the latest in the Jamal Gonzalez investigation. And on Monday, we took a look at question one here in Rhode Island, removing Providence plantations from the state's name with Representative Anastasia Williams and Advocate Deb Sugg. So those are obviously there for you, as are the other 250 episodes of B-Town. Look out wherever you're listening right now. They're up there for you. And uh, obviously a lot going on. Obviously the election front and center. In some cases, we've got a COVID resurgence here. Tune in if you're listening in the morning time. Tune in today at 1 o'clock on my Facebook group or btown.stream. I'll be with Governor Raimondo for, I don't know what, the 120th time this year talking COVID during her weekly COVID address. And uh, certainly plenty of attention on the Jamal Gonzalez matter here in the state and social justice broadly Lots going on, so um, a good way to stay on top of things outside of the podcast is to follow me on social media at Bill Bartholomew on Twitter and Instagram, or again, inside the uh, the Facebook group, search Bartholomew Town Podcast, or simply go to btown.stream. We've been bringing you inside the protests that have gone on throughout the city and that are expected to continue. We've been bringing you inside news conferences. All this is nothing new, but it seems like the intensity and frequency has ramped up in recent times. And not going to let up anytime soon. So stay plugged into Rhode Island, stay plugged into politics, social justice, activism, media, so on and so forth through B Town. Happy to bring it to you and um, really appreciate your support as well. A good way you can support the program, as we are listener supported, is to become a B Town insider. To do that, you can head to patreon.com slash Bartholomew Town, and you'll see for as little as $3 per month, you can help to sustain this program. You can send me an email to bill at ripodcast.com for more info on that or other ways that you can help to grow this project, which we are coming up on three years here in the Ocean State, and it has been an honor to provide you with this content, and um, I appreciate your trust in bringing you the news, the uh, the journalism, the opinion, the analysis and the entertainment that we do here on this program. Okay, so today, Scott McKay. Look out, Scott McKay, ladies and gentlemen, of the Publix Radio. He is back on B-Town, I think for like the third or fourth time, and uh, we have an interesting discussion. He always takes a fascinating perspective, takes that 36,000-foot view, but then kind of like a a bird of prey can swoop in and really get to the focal point of a nuance as well and explain that. So Scott McKay, obviously a unique talent here, in Rhode Island and known nationally as well for his work as a political commentator across the country on NPR. So let's get to it, right? Scott McKay, day three of our week-long series of daily pods ahead of the election. And I'd be remiss, by the way, before we do it, I'd be remiss without telling you that on Election Day, we'll be providing wall-to-wall coverage. We'll be going around the state, of course, socially distanced and so on and so forth, but we'll be hearing from candidates throughout the day. All of that will be on the live stream And uh, I'll put it out as a podcast, sort of a compiled podcast later on in the day. That's kind of what I'm thinking I'm going to do right now is we'll hear from some voices in the morning. And then so the pod next Tuesday will probably come out a little bit later than normal because it's normally normally it's dropping at five o'clock in the morning. So probably not going to be talking to too many candidates at uh, 4 a.m. on Election Day, put it that way. But that's kind of the plan for Election Day. Obviously, on the social media channels I referenced earlier, that's a good way to stay in touch and um with what's going on throughout the day and then uh, inside btown.stream and on the Bartholomew Town podcast Facebook group. I'll be live streaming throughout the day from polling locations and who knows what else, right? Election time, it's a wacky one. Hope everyone's staying safe out there. COVID numbers are certainly surging. There's a lot of important conversations happening right now. So let's stick together. Let's get through all this and try to come out with um, something a little bit better than what we started with, right? Okay, as promised, Scott McKay, of the Publix Radio here on B-Town. I guess right out of the gate, let's get Scott McKay's takeaway on what we should expect here. Voting's already begun. Presidential election 2020. I just want to inject a note of caution to a lot of people who are veteran election watchers. And one is that this thing may not be over on election night in the traditional manner where you come there, you hear the results so many states have mail ballots. There's also 
could be, although I think some of this might be overblown, but we do know there are people threatening to disrupt things, which is awful and ridiculous, I think. But it will not be one of those traditional, you know, I was brought up on Theodore White in those books, The Making of the President. And, and Election Day was a day of great stirring. It was this one day when Americans, you know, from Providence to Pasadena, you know, from Anchorage to Alabama, all came together and cast their ballots in this one kind of civic, almost celebration of self-government. And this year, that may be a lot different. And I think people have to understand is just because they don't know what's going to happen before they go to bed, uh, they have to understand that that doesn't mean there's fraud. That doesn't mean that there's a constitutional crisis. People are going to have to take a deep breath this time and be a bit more patient than they usually are. And I think that that's a good thing that people have to understand, but also our friends in the news media. You know, you don't want to end up with a situation like Florida in 2000, where Tom Brokaw was forced to come on at some god-awful time towards breakfast, closer to breakfast than dinner, and say, not only uh, do the networks that we have egg on our face tonight, we have a whole omelet. And I think that, you know, people hopefully will have some caution. I was on a webinar last week with Julie Pace from the AP and a, uh, uh, Lee Maringoff, the pollster, and Kathleen Hall Jamison. It was fascinating because, you know, people who have been around for a while are just looking at the challenges this time, and I think that's going to be one of the biggest things for the media. Here we saw way back, 1994, Channel 10 got everything wrong in the governor's race, and I'll never forget spending that whole night. I was working at the Journal. Earth York. Phone. Yes, they said she was the governor. They came out. They used some exit polls that were, frankly, not determinative. They should have waited longer, and they didn't, and whatever. Uh, they used some exit polls, and they took them early and ran ran with it. And <clears throat> I never remember spending the rest of the night. Me and Charlie Bax at the Journal and Joe Fleming over at Channel 12, because, of course, they'd been beaten on it. And I got the word from somebody really early. Not from Almond's side, actually, from a uh, York side or a Democratic state chairman. I think it was Guy Dufault at that point who said, look, you know, we want this to happen, but don't jump on this because there's some problems in the Blackstone Valley. And I was sitting there saying, uh-oh, Almond, uh, Link Almond happened to be very popular. He's from Lincoln. He grew up in Central Falls, happened to be very popular in that part of the state. So I just said, let's take a deep breath. Let's not, you know jump out in front of it here. And that was kind of lucky in a way, but also sometimes you just have to wait till the real returns come in. And that's the one piece of caution I have. And I'm probably going to be saying that on our air later this week, just simply to get people to understand that we are in different times, that an election in the middle of a pandemic is, is different. That said, um, I do think that COVID-19 is a bigger issue, and I think it's going to hurt the president uh, across the country. Uh, it's a bigger issue than people thought. You have to look at I just looked at some numbers today that said the infections are rising in 47 states. Right. And deaths, I believe, in 34. Now, deaths, as my wife, who's a doctor, can tell you, is a lagging indicator. People get sick. It takes them a couple, two, three weeks, even longer uh, before they perish if they they do because of this disease. And I think that Trump's people, I mean, even yesterday, we saw the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, saying we can't control the pandemic. That's just not what people want to hear. And, and then he went on 60 Minutes with that atrocious. If you can't handle 60 Minutes, how do you handle four more years? Right. And I think it's going to be very difficult for Trump. On the other hand, we do have something called the Electoral College. So I'm not going to be a silly person and go out and say this thing's over because it isn't. And I think that because of the convoluted way we choose our president, it's anchored in an era, a horse and buggy era. And here we are, we do things with the speed of the internet. But this way we still choose our presidents means that, you know, you can, and we've seen this in our lifetimes, in particular, we, we have a situation where you don't have to get most of the votes. You just have to get most of the votes in these so-called swing or battleground states.
Do you think? I, oh, go ahead. Pardon. No. And I hope I wish there was a solution to that. I think without a constitutional amendment, I think in the short term that I wish that people after this election would go to a situation like Nebraska does and Maine does. And at least you would allocate the electoral votes by individual congressional districts, which frankly is a lot fairer because it's much closer to one person, one vote than the system we now have. It would also expand the map and it would mean that presidential candidates would have to campaign somewhere other than, you know, Philadelphia and, uh, you know, uh, Waukesha and Green Bay <laughs> and yeah. Grand Rapids and all of these other places uh, in swing states that get all the attention. And then, of course, the Florida, which is five different states, as we all know, yeah. uh, that everybody goes to. So I, I just wish there would be some look at the way that things like the Electoral College are colliding with the future demographics of this country. And that's something that's going to be kind of an undercurrent, I think, that's run going to run through a lot of this stuff as we look at election night and we look at the conversation after. That's going to be the big thing is obviously the, the conversation after will extend in the sense of counting the votes. We're going to, as you mentioned, most likely it's going to be a what, a week? Who knows what until we actually have any kind of real definitive numbers, most likely. But then moving forward from there, there's already talk of protests. There's already talk of sure revolution by some people. I mean, who knows what it is, <laughs> but do you think it will pan out into something more substantial where people might say, Hey, you know what? Is it time to look at the electoral college, either abolishing it as a whole, or as you say, moving towards a system that's closer to one-on-one -on -one or one-to-one -one voting, whether it's by congressional district or even County, whatever it may be. Yeah, I think you're going to see that. I also think that for all the doom and gloom here, we may know relatively earlier than we think. I mean, here's the flip side of this. Florida, most of Florida, except for the panhandle, closes at about 7 o'clock. You look uh, at Florida. If Florida goes Democratic, for instance, and we look at some other early states that come in, New Hampshire, the only real swing state in New England is New Hampshire, and that upper district north of Auburn, Lewiston in Maine, where, again, they do allocate them by CD. So, you know, I think if Biden, say, wins Florida early, then Trump's path to the Electoral College becomes pretty darn narrow. That means he would have to sweep uh, the Midwest and upper Great Lakes states. And I, I don't think he can win Minnesota. I don't think he wins Michigan. I also don't think he wins Wisconsin, given the fact that the Democrats aren't being silly this time, and they're paying some attention to it. And I think there will be a higher turnout. One of the things the early voting does show you is that this is a consequential election that people seem to really care about it. And I think yeah. that that's one indication early on that, uh, that the Democrats ought to be happy about. Yeah, and it's, it's going to be – it is an, it, a, a year that it seems like voter participation – maybe on the upswing we constantly hear about well joe biden's rallies are unattended or they're you know when was the last time you saw a bunch of joe biden signs especially in rural settings but i feel like the enthusiasm my own gut reaction anyway is that there is enthusiasm for this election that the mail ballots the emergency early voting mechanisms and then even going out on election day itself is going to translate into big numbers do you get that sense as well yeah, I do. I just think that the early voting, I think all of the mail ballot activity, both pro and con, and the fact that some of the voter suppression things that we see, these legal cases all across the South, people in the drop boxes, I just think that what you're looking at is unprecedented. Part of it, of course, uh, is pushed by the COVID-19 crisis, but also I think a lot of its people see this as a very consequential election. And I'm a couple of things jump out at me. One, even across the South, the turnout in minority neighborhoods where you see people standing in these lines, to me, it's un-American and awful that people have to stand in line for six, seven, or eight hours. But nonetheless, they're actually doing it. And the other thing is the uptick, a pretty strong uptick by the looks 
in young people voting, which was not the case in 2016, which you have to go back to really 2008, 2012 to see a large uh, turnout of young people. And I think that really augurs well for the Democrats at this point because the president, uh, and I don't know why, I mean, I get some of why, but he seems in his administration and Republicans in general have not seemed to even grasp onto the rhetoric of climate change which I think with young people uh, is a real issue that they care an awful lot about. And we are already seeing a lot of that activity. We're seeing people like Biden having to move, frankly, uh, further left on things like the climate crisis than he has. And he's getting some pushback on it, but it hasn't been, I don't think, ridiculous. There's some of the states, the Oklahomas, the Texas, where people say it's a backlash, I'm not sure he was going to win those states anyway. I mean, they're pretty red states. Uh, it might hurt him a bit in, in Pennsylvania, which has yep. something with fracking, but Pennsylvania is a funny state. And I have looked at some numbers of people in places like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Of course, James Carville had the famous line about Pennsylvania, which it was uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Alabama in the middle. Yeah, and A lot of people, I mean, people in in places like Philadelphia, where there are a lot of the state lives in that eastern part of Philadelphia, they're just as upset about climate change, and they're not pro-fracking. It's just, I, I think part of the problem is that is that this, again, is just a rural-urban split. And what happened last time, you look at, there is one of the books, and I always read these books, I forget which one, but the one that jumped out at me was uh, one of the post-mortem books, which... There was President Obama, and it was the day before the election, and one of his aides came in and said, where do they want me tomorrow? Yeah. And and they said, he said, why are you in Philadelphia? And he was, like, kind of startled and said, that's not good news. Yep. You know, if you're still trying to wrap up Philadelphia the day before the election and you're a Democrat, that's not a good place to be in. Discover over 200 episodes of Rhode Island's podcast of record, the Bartholomew Town Podcast, on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your pods. Or head over to our website, ripodcast.com. Tune in every Wednesday at 1 p.m. at btown.stream or on Facebook for Governor Mundo's weekly COVID-19 address. As always, I'll be in the room asking questions and bringing you the latest info and details on COVID-19 here in Rhode Island. And, and you would think that right now things in most of the conventional areas. For example, you mentioned Texas. There are people who are saying, well, if Texas has got a chance to go blue, that seems fairly unlikely. I mean, it does come down to the traditional swing states this year, and we've got to watch Pennsylvania and Florida and I guess Michigan, maybe Ohio, and get an understanding from, from there. But is there, what is, I guess, going to be your big surprise? I say that, I, prep, I, I, I make that assumption, but then what is your big surprise that you might expect to find? I think Colorado mm. could go blue for Biden. It's been purple. I think you may see some Senate races yep. that are unusual. Uh, Steve Bullock in Montana, some places that we don't expect to see upsets. We may see an upset. It looks like McConnell's going to keep his seat, even though there was some polling early on that was a scare. There may be an upset in South Carolina. That would be incredible. If South Carolina had two African-American senators, I know they don't agree on much, but uh, the fact is that that would be something unusual. And what you're seeing in places like Texas all across the South, from what I can tell, and I'm not an expert on that because I haven't spent a lot of time reporting down there. My wife's in Louisiana. I know that state well. I visited a lot. And I spent a lot of time in South Carolina during the 2000 uh, primary, the Republican primary down there, when it was McCain and George W. Bush. So I do think you're getting an urban-rural split there, which somewhat mirrors the rest of the country. You know, there are places in Texas like Houston and Austin and Dallas that have large minority populations or their big college and high-tech centers that are trending blue. And then, of course, you have the traditional rural areas, the kind of areas where ranching and oil and fossil fuels are the big job generators that are still pretty, pretty red. Florida is fascinating because Florida's, I was talking once to the Democratic state chairman in Florida, who 
in those days was a professor, I believe, at Stetson University down there. And he explained to me how many different states Florida is. And immigration changes Florida. You know, Rhode Island, if you looked at the voter rolls and who votes every four years, it's not that much different. We're pretty static. We don't have a lot of change. But a place like Florida, between immigration and between retirees and the fact that it's God's waiting room, means that the voter rolls switch by like 25% every four years. And so you've got a huge elderly population. You've got a lot of Latinos, and they are not of one mind, of course, because of the big Cuban exile community. Around Miami, they're very conservative uh, historically. Uh, They don't like people who uh, sidle up to or want to change relations with Cuba and the Castro regime, which, of course, they fled and all of this stuff. So I think you have an older group of Cubans, uh, the Marco Rubio folks, uh, backers. And then you've got some younger people who are more in the Democratic realm. So I think you're going to have to watch Florida very quickly. And you have places like Orlando, which have recently attracted a lot of people from Puerto Rico because there's a lot of jobs there in the hospitality industry. There's a lot of folks. There's a Haitian community there now in Orlando. There's a, you know, a large group of Puerto Rican folks. And then there's the usual stream of folks who just, frankly, they're sick of the weather in New England and Pennsylvania and New York. And they, uh, they like the no tax environment down there and they moved down to Florida. Definitely going to be all eyes on Florida, no question about it, as we we head to election night. And that may be the one area, like you had mentioned earlier in the conversation, that you can kind of gain some insight on election night. You mentioned Tom Brokaw and the whole presentation that we're used to, the almost sports casting of election. And that will be what the story is, undoubtedly. Yeah, I mean, the early returns should show us something. And some states like Rhode Island are going to count the mail ballots, you know, as they roll in, other states aren't going to do that. I guess the fear is the worst scenario ever would be not like 2000, like one Florida, but the worst scenario would be like seven or eight Floridas. Yeah. Where you've got this total kind of mess and it becomes a lawyer's frittata and there's missing ballots and there's just not, anybody in charge and it looks like there's no one in charge and you've got Republican legislators and democratic governors and they keep fighting with each other. You know, a situation like we've seen in Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, some of these are very, very contested States, Wisconsin, the same thing with a Republican Supreme court there and a democratic governor. So I think you're going to, like I say, the need for patience may be, Uh, bigger than usual. I know that a lot of people are worried on both sides and they're really concerned. And uh, you may see people in the streets in protest. Uh, But I think it would be well, it would be great if everybody could just take a deep breath and not get all partisan crazy on the night of and actually see what happens. But both sides will be lawyered up. I don't think it'll be like 2000 where you have these kind of wingtip Brooks brothers revolution and the Republicans are all in. I think the Democrats this time are very concerned and very worried that they may get the short shrift and there may be a lot of trips to the courthouse if things are locked up and they don't look great. The worst scenario, frankly, would be something like in a battleground state or two where the counting goes down where there are computer glitches and something goes down. And then the conspiracy theorists, as you know, are going to run wild. And I think that it would be really, really good if everybody could finally just take a pause and just realize we've got to let this go. The trouble is that neither side trusts the government. I mean, we are in this anti-government nonsense that's gotten so ridiculous now that I think 20% of the Republicans or something in a poll I showed actually believe in QAnon. Hello. Come on now, right? 
<laughs> yeah, and if you got to, and if those kinds of conspiracy theories are going to run rampant across the landscape, then uh, who knows what could happen? I'm I'm hoping and praying, frankly, that we don't see that because the last thing this country needs right now is divided as we are, in the middle of a pandemic with joblessness soaring, with looking at a tough, tough winter. The last thing we need is a constitutional crisis. This would just be the mother of everything awful. Couldn't agree more. I absolutely, and in fact, some some other talkers, so to speak, some other broadcasters in this market have, have frequently said that whatever the case may be, in fact, it's Matt Allen that I'm thinking of that said, just as long as we can rip the Band-Aid, Band-Aid off of the losing side within a week or less, ideally, um, then he would be comfortable even if his candidate didn't win. It's that thought of it dragging out for an extended period of time and getting into conspiracy zones and potential chaos in terms of protest and, and who knows what else. I mean, we saw ballot drop-off boxes burning in Boston. There's concern about this purge Providence protest or rally that's a right-wing, that's been floating around right-wing leaning chat right. rooms and, and folks, maybe they're going to burn ballot boxes here. A lot of confusion. And the last thing you want to see is the integrity of the election be thrown into question because that will provoke a level of chaos yeah. that even a Biden or Trump victory couldn't on its own. Yeah, I, that's, that's, that's a fear. But, you know, the one thing you have to look at, the strength of our government, the resilience of our government is that, you know, we don't change national governments with tanks in the streets. We're not a banana republic. There's a simple majesty to the peaceful transfer of government on January 20th that hopefully will happen and go off. You know, I'm not sure that Trump wants to show up if Biden wins at the inauguration, whatever. Yeah. But a peaceful transfer of government in a country that has this long, long heritage of self-government. And I think that anything that interrupts that, and like you say, any kind of chaos or any kind of shenanigans around the polling, anything that makes people even less trustful of what's happening is going to be a bad thing right now, given the psyche of the country and where we are. Scott McKay, he's the political commentator for the Publix Radio. You might see him on a new television show that uh, – Someone else you're listening to right now is involved with coming up in uh, a couple of weeks. And, um, hey, one of the uh, Mount Rushmores of Rhode Island media, no doubt about it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just one of the old guys. Been around for a long time. Everybody says, you know, how do you know so much? Or people all put something up and say, well, there's so-and-so is an old friend of mine, somebody from the local media or national media. And they said, gee, how come you have so many old friends? And I simply say, because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to be with you, Bill. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hey, B Town listeners, I'll meet you over on Instagram. I've got two accounts, actually. One is my personal page, at Bill Bartholomew, and then we've got at Bartholomew Town Podcast for all your daily Rhode Island political media, social justice, news, culture, and other content. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.